Thank you very much, John. We move on to our second speaker, um, Maria Kozhenikov. Now, she is an associate professor at the Department of Psychology, and her research focuses on visualization, specifically visualization uh, abilities and how it affects learning, problem solving in mathematics, science, arts, and also creativity in general. Now, the title of her talk is the relationship between different dimensions of creativity and visualizations. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I will give very different perspective, perspective of cognitive neuroscience on creativity. And I will talk about my research. It's off, right? It's on. It's on. Okay. But, um, I will address similar questions that Lawrence raised about the relation between scientific and artistic creativity and how to match them together. So but I will look on the differences between creative processes of scientists and artists. So what is creativity? <clears throat> Actually, for cognitive neuroscientists, it's very important what is creativity to give exact definition. And unfortunately, there is no any consensus regarding what is creativity in experimental psychology or neuroscience. Some neuroscientists define creativity as creative aha process or some state, creative state. Others talk about ability to produce creative work that is both novel, original, and valid in the sense of useful and functional. Uh, why it's important for psychologists? Because they want to measure creativity. And to measure creativity, we need to define it somehow. But we don't have consensus in definition. We don't have consensus how to measure creativity. This is just a long list of all possible instruments cognitive psychologists use to measure creativity. This is Torrance's test of creative thinking, different self-report questionnaires, consensual assessment by expert, inside problem solving, mass verbal, mathematical, and spatial problems, which need this aha experience and professional achievement. So this is common misconception, similar to what Lawrence showed, and I should tell you that there is no basis in contemporary neuroscience for this division. This was very popular in the 80s, but um, there is no evidence that this association is really exists. So as you can see here, here you have creativity, art, and music. Here you have science and math, but actually this is gross oversimplification because like holistic visual processing happening actually in left hemisphere, not in the right, and science and math also could be extremely creative. So uh, this is kind of old, outdated idea. So uh, what I want to say, I want to say that we still don't know as psychologists what are cognitive and neural processes that underlie creativity. Current cognitive neuroscience trying to understand different processes that underlie creativity, and they all mention working memory, executive processing, executive, this is attentional processing, sustained attention, cognitive flexibility, and so on. But uh, again, there's no consensus about what cognitive neural processes underlie this creative process. One of the factors that always was recognized as significant factor in creativity is visualization. Visual, visual working memory and visualization abilities. And I'm going to talk about this. So what evidence we have that visualization is important for creativity? First of all, we have historical evidence. There is plenty of evidence that visualization played a crucial role in scientific insights and discoveries. This is, I just listed some of them, Galileo's laws of motion, Einstein's theory of relativity was actually developed based on visual images Einstein has, Kekko's structure of benzene ring he saw in a dream, this molecule structure, finance theory of quantum microdynamics, all these examples were based on the visualization. So Einstein explicitly said that imagination and visualization is the most important. It's more important than knowledge. Uh, Feynman, who developed all these Feynman diagrams in quantum electrodynamics, mentioned that visualization in, in some form or other is a vital part of my thinking. It was always visualization. In art, we have similar source of genius is imagination alone. So we have all this, um, we have all this historical evidence from scientists and artists how significant visualization for their discoveries. 
Empirical studies in cognitive psychology are not that clear about it. Some studies, I, I will not go through all these descriptions of the studies, I will, I will just say generally. Some studies show very significant correlation, other studies show none. So, no consensus. In conclusion, creativity correlated with some measures of visualization, but not others. Some studies show significant relation, others did not. And relation was found only for specific groups, like for artists, but not for scientists, and vice versa. So there is no, again, consensus about whether visualization is important for creativity. Now, I will talk a little bit from perspective of cognitive neuroscientists in my research. One of the problems here that creativity research didn't incorporate the latest cognitive neuroscience data about visual imagery. According to the latest cognitive neuroscience data, we have two different visual systems in our brain, not one. Now, this is quite recent data because uh, this became apparent with cognitive neuro with neuroimaging, with development of MRI and different neuroimaging techniques. So, um, the fact is that we have two different systems. One is dorsal, this is spatial system. It runs through parietal lobes. This visual system processes information about spatial relations, spatial transformations. This is kind of system the scientists use. They imagine space, they imagine different spatial relations. Now, this visual system is called ventral stream or object processing system. It processes information about color, details, and individual objects how they look like in terms of visual appearances. So when you talk about artists, they probably would use this system. Similar dissociation was found in individual differences. So there are people who are very good in constructing very vivid and colorful images, and they rely more on ventral system, object processing system. And there are people who are very good in representing space and spatial relations. So, and they rely more on spatial visual systems. So we're talking about two very different types of visualization and two very different types of people. So this is our data from visual artists and scientists. So this is, we measure their object visualization. This is colorful pictorial visualization, and this is in red. And spatial visualization, ability to represent space, is measured by different tests, and this is represented by blue. So scientists, because above, this is mean, this is zero means average in the sample. So scientists actually perform significantly better than average on spatial visualization, but are below average on colorful pictorial visualization. We have something very different for artists. Artists perform better on object visualization, but perform worse on spatial visualization. Now, architects, not very clear. And humanities, uh, this is <laughs> okay. Now this is not that bad because because actually visual art artists perform worse on spatial visualization than humanities. So so it's kind of close to average. Okay. So um, this is interviews. Again, I, I will not go through everything. What I want to say that interview, so we did neuroimaging study with artists and scientists, we did all these behavioral experiments to measure their abilities, and we also did interviews. And interviews completely supported our data. Both visual artists and scientists acknowledge the importance of visualization in their creative work. But they reported different views of visualization. Visual artists reported using visualization to express their own feelings. But scientists reporting using visualization as conventional means to present scientific information, maybe in a novel way, but it's still conventional representation. And humanities and philosophers, they, um, they didn't accept the importance of visualization in their work. So um, again, about artists and scientists. Okay, I'll skip these. I'll just show some very significant differences between artists and scientists. So visual artists uh, report generated, generated visual images in a holistic global way. And this is in fact something that object processing system is doing. It generates images of global shape. Scientists use imagery in a different way. They generate imagery, images part by part, sequentially, and then putting them together. And this is actually what spatial imagery system is doing in the brain. So again, this is two different processes. Here you have more holistic and global visual imagery. Here we have more kind of visualization, but more analytical and more sequential. 
Now, visual artists report spontaneous and uncontrolled image generation, and scientists report images generated in a very controlled way. Again, this is very similar. Visual artists report intentionally that they intentionally inspect their images, and scientists they don't expect the, they don't inspect their images because they build them from the beginning with some kind of intention to do something with them. And for visual artists, images have multiple meaning for scientists they have very apparent meanings because it is a means to represent scientific information. Okay, so um, I'll skip this and I will just give an example from famous scientists and artists just to show how different the visualization processes are. So artists actually report uh, that images spring up in their imagination and they like a medium. They just wait for these images to spring up. So again, this is very holistic, spontaneous image generation. Uh, scientists are very different. They, uh, they really do it intentionally. Like Tesla was saying, I change the construction, make improvements, and operate the device in my mind. So it's very sequential and scientific way, intentionally changing images. Uh, Feynman, he actually raises very interesting point, what is creativity and visualization in science. He's saying the whole question of imagination in science is often misunderstood by people in other disciplines. They try to test our imagination in the following way. They say, here's a picture of some people in a situation. What do you imagine will happen next? When we say, I can't imagine, they might think we have a weak imagination. They overlook the fact that whatever we are allowed to imagine inside must be consistent with everything else we know. Again, so this is the same kind of idea that scientists use different kinds of visualization. And this visualization is used as a means to represent scientific information. It is in a very controlled and intentional way. But they still can reconstruct and rearrange these images in a very, very novel and very creative way. So it doesn't mean it's not creative. It's just different from visualization used by artists. OK, so this is, I'll just show my results. This is, um, I'll go quickly. In creativity, we have very similar situation and similar debate about domain-specific creativity and general creativity. And there is recent evidence that there are different types of creativity. So this is factor of statistical analysis that dis distinguish between artistic bodily creativity, my science creativity, writing communication. as three different types of creativity. Similar study, they dissociated between art and science creativity. So this is our study and what we did in our study. We gave people all kinds of different spatial visualization tasks. This is spatial visualization. In spatial visualization task, you need to fold these images. You fold the image and you need to imagine how it looks like when unfolded, where these holes will fall. So on this one, you need to, to identify whether to fit this in a path the same or different. So you need mental rotate. This is usually the task given to science to measure their spatial ability. So in this case, these two images should be different. Okay, this is uh, object visualization. In object visualization task, we ask people to identify pictures. This is shape, and this is, I don't know if you can see, this is umbrella. So this is kind of task that artists do very quickly. Um, and all kinds of self-report questionnaires about um, vividness of imagery. So, and we gave them different creativity assessments. So this is torrent test of creative thinking. This is inside problem solving where you need to connect these dots in one kind of stripe and one stroke. And uh, people, this is a solution. People cannot kind of think outside the box, so they cannot understand that they need to draw this line outside these nine dots. Uh, and we gave them all kinds of self-report machineers. This is creativity, creative behavior inventory, and it has art scale, science scale, and literature scale. So this is our result, what we found. We found the Torrance test and self-report creativity, artistic, and all object visualization tests, they all loaded on one factor. Again, this is statistical procedure. This number shows that, it's, that all these creativity assessments related to artistic scales and uh, all object visualization questionnaire, they constitute one factor. All spatial assessment, spatial visualization, and all questionnaires related to scientific creativity fall into one factor. 
and verbal assessments, and this is self-report related to literature, to creativity in literature, they fall on the self factor. So it really seems to be different types of creativity. Again, it doesn't mean there is no underlying process that underlies all of them, but they still different in some way. Okay, so um, how much? Okay, so very quickly, I'll skip all these. I'll show collaborative creativity and visualization data. So the question now, if their processes, creative processes are so different, if scientists and artists use different types of visualization, how they can communicate between each other, how possible to make um, their collaboration effective. So we did one study, I'll show just briefly slides. And so we gave to children, this is children, 11, 17 years old, and this is gifted children. So we have four groups, four visual art group, four science group, four humanities group, and four mixed group. There were six, eight adolescents in the group, and we asked them to draw creative planet. So we wanted an unknown planet. So we wanted to compare their drawings and study their collaboration processes. So I'll just show you what to draw. This is what artists draw. This is an uh, unknown planet. This is four group of artists created all this interesting planet of all different shapes. This is what uh, scientists draw. Uh, this is actually very creative in the sense uh, that this is very conventional. And when they were communicating about drawings, they were they were they discussed this a lot, and uh, they were very accurate about drawing, for example, these cracks. So they will be consistently similar to each other. So, and everything will look like in textbook, and it's a conventional shape, because for them, visualization should be means of conventional representation of science. But nevertheless, this image is quite creative from, from different scientific perspectives. Uh, this is humanities group. Uh, <laughs> they're very similar, and this group are not particularly excited about this task. Uh, <laughs> so, this is next group. This is what I want to show because mixed group consisted of people of different uh, specialization and interestingly they found they found kind of way to communicate with each other. So this is scientist and visual artist and scientists took this part of the space and they presented <laughs> the planet from the view from the space and artificial close output to the flag. So it's kind of interesting combination and here scientists were particularly frustrated by what uh, humanities drew, so they made a planet like a like an airplane going through the space. So, so, and then we evaluated these uh, pictures. We gave them to experts from different disciplines, and actually, this group was evaluated very highly by everyone. So, which means uh, it was very interesting because scientists evaluated um, artists quite low, and artists evaluated scientists quite low, but. <laughs> Everyone was um, everyone was kind of excited about next group. So definitely collaboration possible if you take into account differences in visualization and differences in the processes of artists inside. 